Well, welcome back. Today we're starting Chapter 10, which is Leading Teams. Now, I've been a part of many teams in the military and in civilian life. And we used to have a saying in the military, there are some leaders who we would follow into fire, and then there are some that we would throw into the middle of it. I hope that you're not the latter. But today we're going to take a look at some of the concepts of teams and how they can form and how they can function effectively as we begin Chapter 10 of leadership, and that's leading teams. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to start Chapter 10, which is leading teams. And from my experience, I've dealt with teams quite extensively, military, uh, private sector, uh, colleges, and so forth. Teams are a unique type of construct in as much as they can work when everything is going right and when they get together for the right purpose. However, when a team is not given the appropriate parameters and if you really don't know uh, really the, the, the need for the team and how teams operate, it can be disastrous. So we're going to talk about some of the uh, pros and cons of teams as I've been able to experience it and as the book talks about here as we move on with leading teams. Now, the value of teams. Teams can be valuable. Uh, they work in an interdependent relationship where supposedly, and I say supposedly because it doesn't always work like that, uh, teams are supposed to come together and each person in that team is supposed to perform his or her duties and you depend upon each other. Uh, and that way you ensure coordination. As you see here, you see information sharing and you see exchange of materials. The value of what I have been able to uh, see with teams and experience myself is that you get a whole lot more done when teams are used appropriately than you can through individual parts. When Toyota won the Malcolm Baldridge Award, which is the award for excellence in business and management and so forth, one of the bragging rights of the winner of this award is to let competitors come in and see how you run your business. It's kind of like bragging rights. So when Toyota won the Malcolm Baldridge Award, we had GM and Ford and Chevrolet and all of the big uh, automobile manufacturers come in, and they saw where the equipment was the same. Toyota had nothing different as far as the equipment, the processes. Uh, they still formed uh, uh, pretty much an assembly line. They had equipment, material that was pretty much the same. Only when they started looking at the way the people interacted did they start to see why Toyota had been eating their lunch for so long. The corporate culture at Toyota was more of a team uh, type of experience where the individual was important, but the individual was there to support the whole. And they developed focus groups and teams and quality circles and Kanban and all of these things that you see in production management and in operations management. But the key to it was that they were able to harness the value of teams in a productive way. Now, at the beginning, I said if the team is working like they're supposed to work and they're there for the right reason and understand if companies understand the um, uh, the purpose of teams, uh, it can be fine, but if they don't, it can be disastrous. And Motorola is a prime example of that. Motorola, Motorola had led the industry in mobile communications, and they wanted to far surpass any competition that might be struggling or coming up close to them, which one was Nokia. And at this time, the concept of teams was just taking off. And this is the era of total quality management and so forth. So teams were highly emphasized. So Motorola decided to develop uh, research teams. In fact, they developed 13 research and development teams. And within a year, they were suffering tremendously. They were hemorrhaging money uh, from every area of their department. 
And the reason being was that these research and development teams were not speaking to each other, and they were replicating and duplicating each other's efforts. So you figure wasting money times 13. This is what was happening, and what the teams were putting out into the organization, uh, the the organization was replicating. So as it uh, turned out, not only did Motorola's emphasis on teams didn't work, but because of the amount of waste and lack of productivity, they ran second to Nokia. Nokia had, uh, had been able to overcome them, and uh, Motorola came in second place in the mobile phone industry, or yeah, in the mobile communication industry. So we see here the need to understand the concept of teams, why they form, how they function, and so forth, and how they should be used, and for how long. Not every team should last forever. Uh, There are some teams that are there for a specific purpose, but once that purpose is complete, they should move on and disband and, and go on to further things. So these are some of the values that a team brings, and there's also benefits. You do have higher productivity when everything is working right. The quality should improve because you are taking the recommendations and input from different people and putting it into a common effort. And as a result, quality should improve. You have greater flexibility and speed. You can do more quicker with more people if the team is working properly. You have a flatter management structure, and what a flatter management structure means is that you take the decision-making out of the hands of the people at the very top, and you distribute that authority throughout the, the team so that each person has responsibility to make decisions and uh, they have obligations that they have to perform within that team, and they're accountable. It also leads to increased employee involvement and satisfaction. And if they feel like they're a part of something and they have a shared identity, that can lead to higher morale and involvement and what we call engagement and a lower turnover. If people believe in what they're doing, if they feel like they are contributing to a common purpose that they can get behind and value and share, then chances are they're going to stay because they feel like this is a part of them. And this is how it used to be back in the older days when you had companies that uh, hired people and they could relatively expect to stay in that company throughout their whole life. Uh, uh, and that was job security, and you would see grandparents and and dads and sons go to work for the same company. Now, that has eroded, but you can still garner that shared sense of identity and and value and pride just by uh, soliciting and leveraging the value of teams and promoting a culture of teamwork. Now, a team, we've talked about it, so what's the definition? Well, a team is a unit of two or more people who interact and coordinate their work to accomplish a shared goal or purpose. You know, one of the difficulties in a team, and we're going to see that here in a few minutes, is getting everybody on the same page uh, and getting them to interact. You know, with diversity now, Uh, You've got different values, cultures, all types of diversity that are coming into a collective unit and you're trying to perform a function or accomplish a goal and so forth, and that can be different or difficult, especially if people are diverse in their backgrounds and priorities and so forth. But a team has a shared goal and or purpose. I was watching a football game last night, and I was looking at how each person on that team uh, or on those teams were coordinated. Each person had their own responsibility. The team uh, depended upon each other for the success or failure of that team. Now, you had a person who was uh, given the glory, the quarterback, and the quarterback, I guess, is considered to be the leader of that team uh, on offense. But 
that quarterback can do nothing if he doesn't have a line in front of him doing what they need to do or if he has doesn't have runners or catchers who are doing what they're supposed to be doing. That quarterback can do nothing without that team, but yet the team can do nothing without that quarterback. So there is an interdependence there, and there's a coordination and an interaction that has to take place. So that's really how a team is. Now, there's been an evolution of teams. As you see in Exhibit 10.1, there is a migration from functional team to cross-department teams to self-directed teams. And the key to this is this section right here, or this uh, bullet, leader-centered. Here the leader gives up a little bit of power, and here the members uh, determine their own uh, direction and so forth because they're self-managed. So really the evolution of teams centers around the amount of authority that a leader is given, whether it is centralized, which means that the leader has all the control, or decentralized, which goes to self-managed teams. But you can see here in a functional team, uh, they exist to serve a purpose, uh, a specific purpose. Um, they can work to uh, just like a, uh, a football team. Uh, they're there to win a game, and that's it. Once the game is won, they move on to the next game. You have cross-departmental teams, and these are people who have different specialties. Uh, you're not just taking research and development, for instance, uh, and making a team out of them. What you're doing is taking research and development. You're taking people from finance. You're taking people from marketing. You're taking people from operations, and you are combining all of those people, putting them together, and coming up with a shared purpose and solution for issues that that organization is facing. And then you have self-directed teams, and they are member-centered. Uh, they do their own thing, whereas a cross-departmental team may have a little bit of leadership or someone at the top who is given some power, um, uh, exerting some power over that team. With a self-directed team, you have the team being in charge at this point and determining what needs to be done, when, where, and, and how. Now, some of the dilemma for team members, uh, you have to give up your independence uh, because you're no longer a part of, of just a one-man or one-woman show. Now you are a part of a collective. And again, no one is more important than the other. Others may get more recognition at times or whatever, but uh, everybody is needed. And then you also have to put up with free riders. Now, free riders are those who just sit around and let the team do the work. We also call it social loafing. Now, this is a phenomenon that happens when you get people together. There are some who just say, listen, I'll be a part of the team, but I really don't want to do anything. In my graduate classes, when I teach graduate school or graduate classes at other universities, I always usually give them a project uh, that they have to accomplish as a team, and I may break them up into two or three teams, and it never fails probably usually about a week before the team project is due, I'll have people calling and they'll be crying. They'll be distraught, upset. Uh, Dr. Marshall, so-and-so has not done anything through the whole time. They've just sat back and watched us do all of the work. And part of the reason why I assign group projects is for this very reason. They've got to learn how to deal with social loafers. Now, it's better to deal with it while in school than to be over a project and have to deal with them and not be prepared for them. So social loafing is something that happens not just in school, but it happens in work. And uh, you can, you can um, um, really jeopardize your team's ability to fulfill its obligations if you allow them to just do nothing. You, you need to be able to interact with them. Uh, sometimes it takes a talking to. Sometimes it takes, you know, just a little bit of encouragement or whatever. 
and sometimes you have to threaten them with punitive action and so forth. So whatever the uh, circumstance may warrant, just know that you're going to have those who in most every team I've ever known will not want to pull their weight. And then teams are sometimes dysfunctional. And again, I'm using the example of Motorola where the teams became really counterproductive and they cost the organization money uh, all for the sake of that company, uh, Motorola, having teams. So if you don't need teams, don't develop them. Don't bring them about. Only when you need teams should you bring them together and you need to know the purpose, the reason, uh, the parameters in which that team will function, uh, how long they should be together, and the objectives that they should accomplish. Now, some of the dysfunctions of teams, you have lack of trust. Um, that develops over time, and that can be a challenge because there may be some circumstances where your team doesn't have a lot of time to accomplish its goals. When 9-11 happened, uh, the federal government came out with a mandate to all airports that they had to provide a security procedure. They had to provide a security uh, environment where the threat of what had happened, the terrorist attack, uh, wouldn't happen again. Now, this is an area that no one had had to deal with before, so comp or airports had to develop these teams to address this problem, and they had six months to develop a comprehensive plan or they would be fined $10,000 a day. So sometimes you just don't have time to develop the way you want to, uh, but still you've got to get the job done. Fear of conflict, and this is re the reason why a lot of uh, managers and leaders shy away from teams because they look at teams as a breeding ground for conflict. And yeah, you're going to have conflict. You're going to have differences of opinion. You're going to have different values and perspectives on things, but really that's what you want. Now, should conflict exist? Well, that depends. There is positive conflict and negative conflict, what we call warranted and unwarranted conflict. Warranted or positive conflict challenges ideas. Are you sure we need to go in this direction? Have you thought about this direction? Or I believe we should be focusing on this, that, and the other. All of these things can be positive because it can give you insight uh, from more than just one person on the direction and the priorities and the methodology of the team. Now, negative or unwarranted conflict is when you've reached the point where you're not challenging ideas anymore, but you're challenging the person well, you're dumb, or you are uh, looking at this from a selfish point of view, or you just want to uh, be in charge of everything. This is where you're attacking the person. So you want to avoid that because that's never productive. Lack of commitment, uh, a lot of times, unless the team is focused, it can lose uh, uh, momentum. Again, you have those who are social loafers, so you've got that to deal with, and then you have avoidance of accountability. Uh, that's where the people don't want to accept responsibility for the outcome. Everybody loves uh, a, a, a productive team, and everybody is going to accept uh, praise when the team does what it's supposed to do. But um, when it comes to the team maybe failing, are uh, not accomplishing what it wants to do, that's when you get to the finger pointing. Uh, you know, blame or failure has, uh, well, I've heard the saying say one time, uh, success has many uh, parents, but failure is an orphan. And that pretty much just means that when things are successful, when your group is successful, everybody wants to take uh, uh, part in the um, uh, in, the, in the responsibility. But when you fail, no one wants to. So you have that avoidance of accountability. And then inattention to results. Uh, they put personal ambition or the needs of their own uh, selves or departments ahead of the collective um, good and so forth. So those are some of the dysfunctions of teams. There are many more, but those are some of the broad 
major categories of issues that you're going to have to be dealing with if you're going to be leading teams or be in a team. Now, Exhibit 10-3, and this will be our last slide today, talks about the five stages of team development. And usually teams develop in a sequential stage, a uh, set of processes that begin with forming, then storming, then norming, then performing, and then adjourning. Now, let's go to the beginning. Let's look at forming. Forming, form, forming is when you first form up. Uh, everybody is kind of feeling the, each other out. You're not usually going to be very vocal at this point, kind of like the first day of class. And you're in a large classroom, and no one really wants to talk because you're uncertain of your environment. And so you're kind of going to be reserved, and you're going to feel things out. That's how teams begin. They're going to kind of just um, uh, look around. They'll be cordial to each other and, and um, uh, be pleasant. Uh, but they're really feeling people out and seeing what the environment is going to be like for that team. Once you move out of the forming stage, normally you go to the storming stage. And the storming stage here is where people have become more comfortable, and now they're asserting their, uh, their authority maybe. Uh, they're marking their territory, perhaps. Uh, you might have been in a team or a group or even a class where – the person or people might have been quiet at the very beginning, but now they're trying to start taking over. Uh, they're starting to be more vocal, and uh, they're giving more direction instead of just being a part um, and uh, blending in. They're kind of trying to stand out and take over. So uh, this is where conflict starts. This is where people start challenging authority, and they start looking at um, the differences of each individual and uh, engaging in disagreements and conflict. Norming happens when you have finally come to the point after disagreeing and conflict that if you're going to accomplish your goals, you're going to have to get over it. You're going to have to get over each other and yourself and start performing as a team. So here is where you are starting to put the needs of the team above your own needs. And once you finish that, you move on to the next phase, which is performing. Now, performing, uh, as it says, this is where you are engaged, you're working, uh, together, you are accomplishing your goals, and you're getting the job done. And then finally, you have a journey. And a journey is where you are at the point where the job is done. You don't need to stay together anymore. You disband. Now, again, you normally go in a sequential stage, forming, storming, norming, performing, and a journey. Now, it's important to understand that sometimes teams may never get out of any one of these uh, stages. Let's take, for instance, forming. Some people can get together and never, never really launch anything. Everybody's wondering what the other person's going to do. And you might have been in teams sometimes. You've been meeting and getting together, but you really don't know what you're getting together for because it, you never seem to get out uh, of, the, uh, of the stage of just looking around and observing. No one wants to take leadership. No one wants to be proactive. So you can stay in the forming stage. Conversely, you can stay in the storming stage. You can be so bitter and fighting so much that you never get anywhere uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the objectives of the team and why they form. So, and I have been in uh, uh, teams sometimes where there's just so much divisiveness that you, you can't get anything accomplished. Uh, but the, you, you can stay stuck in one or uh, you're supposed to be moving up sequentially, but you can stay stuck, but you can also regress. Let's say, for instance, you're performing and then your team gets disbanded or you lose some team members. 
Well, if that's the case, you may go back to forming where you have to take on brand new people in that team, and they may have to start the, uh, the process with your team uh, from the very beginning, and then you go through the same stages again. So you can move up, down, you can be stuck in any one stage at any given time, but the key is to get to the point where you can adjourn and then move on to other uh, bigger and, and more uh, uh, bigger and more responsibilities within that organization. Well, that's all we've got for today, and tomorrow we'll finish uh, uh, looking at the first phases of team development. And until then, you have a good day. Well, today you got a basic introduction of teams and how teams form. You know, you might not have realized that teams do form in a progressive manner from the forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning aspect. Each development of a team goes through its challenges and its triumphs. Jesus, when he formed up his team, the, uh, the disciples, uh, there were some uh, of, of those elements in each one of his uh, disciples as he uh, modeled leadership. He brought them along to where they were finally functioning in an appropriate manner. And you can do the same thing by following his principles and by some of the things that we're going to be learning this week. Well, I hope you've had a good time with this chapter so far, and we will continue on tomorrow as we go a little bit further in managing teams.